over the last few weeks, we started this new series in the book of Habakkuk called Trusting God in Difficult Times. And so far in our studies, we have seen that the people of Judah have been wandering away from the Lord. The prophet Habakkuk had become very disturbed by this wickedness, by this gross immorality, by the injustice that he saw around him all the time. And of course, the prophet Habakkuk, his heart was broken over this, and he prayed fervently for God to bring about change. And in chapter 1, verse 4, we see Habakkuk's first complaint. In chapter 5, verse 11, we saw God's answer to his first complaint. And then last week, in chapter 1, verse 12 to 17, we saw Habakkuk's second complaint. Well, today, except for the first verse of chapter 2, all of the second chapter is God's response to Habakkuk's second complaint. And Habakkuk has questioned how God is going to judge the nation with such devastation when he had made a promise to Abraham about this nation that would bring about the Messiah. And Habakkuk also questioned how God would use a more wicked nation to, to judge them. And he concluded his questioning of God by saying that he would wait, watching for God's response and how God will reprove him. So there are two answers that God gives in the next passage in chapter 2. The first answer is in our text this morning, which we will deal with from verse 2 to verse 5. And the second answer is from verse 6 to verse 20, which we will look at next week. But in today's lesson, we will concentrate on God's first answer for Habakkuk. So if you would stand with me, we will read from verse 1 to verse 5. The title of my sermon this morning is The Righteous Live by Faith. The Righteous Live by Faith. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as, he, uh, as his own all peoples. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for your spirit, please, to teach us this morning. We know, Lord, that you have allowed your word to be recorded for us to learn from. We know, Lord, even this specific passage has been recorded for our admonition and our edification and our training and teaching in righteousness. So we pray, Lord, please teach us this morning that we may know you better, that we may love you, that we may depend on your character more and more, that we may trust you more and more. And we pray, Lord, that as these events are unveiled to us, that we would respond in a way that that honors you in a way that reflects your glory amongst the people that we live with in difficult times. We pray, Lord, that you give us understanding and your spirit would teach us today. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. It was everyone's nightmare at 15,000 feet Edmund gravely died at the controls of his small plane. He and his wife were on their way to Georgia from the Rocky Mountains in North Carolina. His wife, Janice, did not know how to fly, but she managed to keep the plane in the air for two hours. And during that time period, she continually radioed for help. And several air traffic controllers heard her screaming, Help, help, won't someone help me? My husband and pilot is unconscious. 
But there was a serious problem keeping her from getting help, a problem she didn't even realize. Although the authorities could hear her distress calls, they weren't able to reach her by radio. Why? Because she kept changing the channels. She wouldn't wait long enough at any channel for a response from a controller. Amazingly, Janice Gravely survived the crash, although she had to crawl for 45 minutes to a farmhouse to find the necessary help. Waiting, I'm sure you would agree, is one of the hardest things to do in life, especially as a Christian, especially during a time of crisis. No one likes to wait. Waiting seems to me to be the rule rather than the exception, isn't it, in our lives? And the exception is an open door. When you have one, go through it, of course. But the truth is that just doesn't happen very often. The bursts of green light seem to happen for just a few short moments in our lives, and the rest of the time is filled with, with yellow lights and mostly red, red lights that continually flash, wait, stop, wait, stop. And Habakkuk knew, like a few others, what it meant to wait for God. And like all of us during the tough times in life, he was tempted to to switch the channels, but he resisted that temptation. And in doing so, he sets before us um, a model that is worthy of our study. My first point this morning is in verse 1. Faith waits on the Lord. Faith waits on the Lord. In verse 1, we read, please follow me in your Bibles, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaints. So as we saw last week, this is part of Habakkuk's prayer. The prophet wants an answer And we see what what he does here. He goes off to pray. It seems like Habakkuk may have gone to a fortress with a a military watchtower far above the the crowds and the, the plains of people so that he could pray, so that he could wait on the Lord. He got away from the busyness of his life to seek an answer from God. And Habakkuk was still in doubt, and so he yielded the problem to God in faith. He was waiting for God's answer. I think this is where most of us go wrong. Well, if, you, if you're like me, anyway, we go on our knees and we, tol- we tell God about the thing that is, that is worrying us. And you tell Him that we cannot solve the difficult problem ourselves. And you tell Him that you do not understand the, the solution, just like Habakkuk did. And so you ask the Lord how to deal with it and to show you His way. And in the moment you get up from your knees, you begin to worry about the problem again, isn't it? Isn't this what happens over and over again? And in his perplexity, Habakkuk said, in effect, I am going to get out of this valley of depression. I'm going to the watchtower. I'm going up to the the heights. I'm going to look to God, to God alone, not to myself. I think this is one of the most important secrets of the Christian life. We need to learn how to hand our problems over to the Lord and to leave it with the Lord rather than taking it back, to lean into the Lord and to trust Him for an answer. Wait for an answer. And Habakkuk looked at his problem, but he could not see any light. He was confronted by the fact that God was going to take these Terrible Babylonians. Remember, people altogether worse than his, his own nation. And he was going to use these Babylonians for his own purpose. Habakkuk could not understand this. He could not understand it. He could not reconcile it in his mind with the holiness of God and the character of God that he understood. But he could and he did take it to God. And he waited for God. And having done so, he looks to God and he sees to look at this difficulty which he did not understand. And this brought him peace. This is the true basis of spiritual peace. 
even though we don't understand these circumstances, to trust the Lord in His character, that He knows best, that He is better than we are, that He is God, that we are not. And that's exactly what Paul means in Philippians chapter 4. You probably know this verse. In verse 6, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything. It doesn't matter what the problem is. Never let yourself become anxious. Never let yourself be, become burdened or worn down by this, by this care. We have no right to be anxious, the Scripture says. In fact, it's a sin to be anxious. And this type of anxiety, this type of anxious care is not only spiritually crippling, but it also physically debilitating. It can depress us. It can take us into places that we don't want to go. That's what Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 6. Never be anxious, but, he says, in everything, not in some things, in everything, it's all inclusive. He says, by prayer and by supplication, with thanksgiving unto the Lord, let your requests be made known. And then he says in verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a battle for our hearts, folks. This is a battle for our minds. This crippling anxiety that Satan uses as a tactic to draw us away from the love of Christ. We need to wait on the Lord and not be anxious and trust the Lord. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Keep your finger in Habakkuk chapter 2. But turn to Romans chapter 4. I want to give you a, a practical example of a person who waited on the Lord in faith. And this passage here in Romans 4 tells us that as Abraham waited, he was strengthened in his faith. Look at Romans chapter 4. In verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God." He grew strong in his faith as he waited, folks, as he waited. Verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's a very unusual account of someone who has been waiting. That's a very unusual outcome, isn't it, of someone who has been waiting. That's not what we would expect. We tend to think that having been given a promise from God, a person might well wait to begin with a vibrant faith. But as, as the wait drags on, it seems like the faith would also gradually weaken out. But why then did Abraham's faith grow stronger and stronger? Because of what he did as he waited. Because of what Abraham did as he waited. During his wait, Abraham became a student of the character and of the power of God as he studied his Bible, as he spent time in the Word, as he prayed. He meditated on the glory of God. He did not dwell on the difficulty of his situation. He meditated on the glory of God. How am I supposed to have a child being a hundred years old? That's not humanly possible. He didn't go there. He didn't go there. He meditated on the glory of God and His power and what God is able to do. Waiting on God is good for us, folks. Waiting on God is good for us. If God acted immediately every time that we cried to Him, we would be the ones who are in control, isn't it? Not God. 
We would be the ones who are dictating to God. We would call the shots. And we would not possess His wisdom. We don't possess His wisdom. Having to wait causes us to learn to trust Him and to trust His timing. And usually our view of, of waiting is like at the doctor's office. We see it as a meaningless waste of time. We, or if you like me, like men, we're stuck in the reception area. We have nothing to do. So we get a magazine and we look at recipes at the back of the magazine. It's a waste of time, isn't it? But our waiting on God must not be looked upon like this. It must not be understood like this. The sort of waiting to which we are called is not inactivity. It is to be active, actively dwelling on and meditating on the glory of God. It is a very positive, purposeful, and spiritual experience. To be called to wait is to be called to the activity of remembering who God is, remembering who I am and who God is. To be called to wait is to be called to the activity of worship, worshiping God for His presence, for His wisdom, for His power, for His love, and for His grace. And to be called to wait is to be called to the activity of serving others, looking for opportunities, for ways to lovingly assist and encourage others who are also being called to wait in similar experiences, similar circumstances. Not just to do nothing, not just to dwell on your bad situation, but to be called to wait is to be called to the activity of praying, confessing the struggles of your heart, and seeking the grace of God who has called you to wait. We must rethink waiting and remind ourselves that waiting is itself a call to action. It's a call to exercise our faith as we wait on the Lord. A very corporate application here, I firmly believe, is this waiting period that we as a church have been called upon by the Lord for three years to wait for an answer. And we haven't been doing nothing during that time. We haven't been miserable and thinking of our bad circumstance as people have left and as our church has got smaller. We've been waiting on the Lord. We've been praying. We've been confessing our struggles. We've been serving and seeking the grace of the Lord. I think the Lord has made us stronger as a church because of that. The Lord has helped us through a difficult situation, but the Lord has answered our prayer in, in His timing, in His perfect timing. It's been an exercise of our faith as we wait upon the Lord. Secondly, we see in verse 2 and verse 3, the answer that Habakkuk was finally given. We see, secondly, faith hears the Lord. Look at verse 2. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. I will surely come. It will surely come. It will not delay. Verse 2, he hears the voice of the Lord. Verse 1, he's waiting. But in verse 2, he hears, finally hears the voice of the Lord. He finally hears the answer. And God's response is clear here. Even though Habakkuk was trying to change God's mind about the Babylonians being used by him for judgment, God emphatically announces that his plans are moving ahead. They are not changing in spite of the prophet's protests. In fact, one could almost paraphrase verse 2 in this way. Write these words on a billboard, Habakkuk, so that anyone passing by might read them. These words were not just for Habakkuk. These words were for everybody to hear. The prophet was to proclaim this vision God had given to him. It was going to happen just as God had planned it and just as it was to be prophesied. It was going to happen when God said it would happen. There was no turning back. The day of judgment was at hand for Judah. The instrument of Judah's judgment was, was already on standby, waiting. 
And God told the prophet to write the prophecy very clearly, as we see here, so that everybody could read it. Everybody could know about it. This message was to be circulated. And God makes the point in verse 3 that the fulfillment of the vision awaits its appointed time. So even though this devastating judgment had not yet happened, it was definitely coming. It may seem slow to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, but it was coming. God did not want his people to think that Habakkuk's message was false simply because there would be an interval of time before this was to be fulfilled. I think in God's mercy, he was giving a time period for the Israelites to repent of their sins. But nonetheless, this judgment was going to happen. It was going to happen. And I think we see this often. There's a common statement made by our Lord concerning His judgments. He says, wait for it. Wait for it. And His words and promises are certain. Even though His judgments are not immediate, does not mean that God's declaration will not be fulfilled. The Apostle Peter made the same point to the dispersed church, the dispersed Christians in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, when he said to them, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. There's a reason the Lord is slow to judge, folks. God forbid we pray His judgment in the next five minutes. Can you imagine that? The people who would perish, that we love, pray for God's mercy. Be thankful for His slowness. God has appointed time for judgment. Wait for it. It will happen. Pray for those who would perish, that they would reach repentance. God judges sin, folks. And as Christians, those who trust in Christ alone for salvation, we know God as our Savior. He saved us from the judgment of our sin. But those who haven't repented of their sins, they will not know God as their Savior. They will know God as their judge. The day of judgment is coming. And on that day of judgment, all people will see God's glory manifested in His final judgment on wickedness. Turn with me to the Old Testament quickly in Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah proclaims the coming day in which the Lord will enter into judgment with all flesh. It's important that we see these words. This is the final judgment. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh. And those slain by the Lord shall be many. And those who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens, following one in the midst, eating pig's flesh and the abomination and mice, shall come to an end together, declares the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming together, all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pal, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away. They have not heard my fame, or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. This is when the day of judgment comes, folks. God's glory is declared in His judgment. Understand that. God's glory is not just declared in His love, but in His judgment. This passage is talking about the final day of judgment. On that day, nothing will escape God's sight. There will be no more injustice. He knows the works and the thoughts of all people, he says in verse 18. And on that day, just a plain ritual observance or outward re religion will not save anybody. 
God will bring an end to the wicked. Both those who make an outward show of faith and those who reject his covenant altogether. And God will be right in judging those who do that. He will be just. And he will get the glory for that. R.C. Sproul, he comments on this passage in Isaiah. He says, On that day, God will manifest his glory. All nations will see it, and it will be heralded by all. For the Creator gets glory not only in creating and saving people, but also in executing his righteous judgment. That day of judgment will magnify the Lord's glory, for we will see his attribute of righteousness on full display. And every mouth will be stopped and unable to protest divine injustice. For it will be plainly evident under God's law that there is no injustice at all in our Lord. God will show his glory in the end. The day of judgment will happen, folks. It is written. Let's pray for our loved ones while the Lord tarries for them to turn away from the wrath of God that will bring him the glory from the judgment of sin. Let's pray for them. Let's reach out to them before it's too late. Number three, faith obeys the Lord. Faith obeys the Lord. The centerpiece of God's response to Habakkuk's complaints is found in verse four. Look at verse four. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Look at verse 5. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol like death. He has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. It looked to Habakkuk as though the Babylonian victory would be the end of all God's people and the end of all of his promises to them. That's what he thought. And the lesson Habakkuk was learning is that God will always honor his promises. The vision Habakkuk received was a promise that God would judge those who were proud and those who were arrogant and who were sinners. In effect, God said, it's all right, Habakkuk. I've heard your prayer. I understand your confusion. Here is my answer. The Babylonians I am raising up to be a tool of my judgment. I'm using them to punish Judah with themselves in turn to be completely defeated and destroyed. I'm not going to close my eyes to their wickedness. The greatness of the Babylonians, which we heard about last week, was was to be short-lived. It was God who, for a special purpose, had raised up these Babylonians. But remember, we saw last week, they took the glory for themselves. They became puffed up. They became inflated with a sense of their own grandness and their own power. And then God struck them down. And later he raised up the Medes and he raised up the the Persians who totally destroyed the the Babylonians. God would save a remnant of the righteous as the prophets before had prophesied. And Habakkuk had to believe this by faith. That God wasn't making a mistake. That God knew what he was doing. He had to believe. He needed to endure the days ahead by walking in obedience to God's word. It wasn't going to be easy. The life he knew it was never going to be the same. According to verse 4, there, we see there are two kinds of people. We see in verse 4, those who are proud and whose souls are not right. And secondly, those who are righteous and who live by faith. Two different, completely types of people there. When you boil it down, it comes to this, doesn't it? Those whose souls are not right are those who are proud. They trust in themselves for salvation. They believe that their good works are sufficient to to save them. They despise grace as a form of charity which they never want or they think they need. And in contrast to these proud and arrogant people are the righteous who rely on God, who who trust in God. Those who are saved, they've stopped trusting in themselves. They've stopped trusting in their own goodness. They've stopped trusting in their good works. 
they trust in God. They know that He alone can save them from their sins. And the righteous are not delivered by improving their, their self-esteem or by getting a better education. In the face of judgment, in difficult times and perplexing times, what do the righteous do? They do not live by relying on, on their wealth, the scriptures say, or even by wine. In the face of difficult times, they don't look for relief. In the face of difficult times, the righteous live by their faith. By their faith. The righteous put their trust in their God. The righteous do not live by their own knowledge. They don't live by their pride, by their achievements, or by their arrogance. The righteous live by their faith in difficult times, in good times. The wicked rely on themselves, while the righteous rely on God, and they rely on His promises. This is the way the righteous need to live every day. I think this is a powerful statement to tell Habakkuk as an answer to his complaints, isn't it? Habakkuk, the righteous live by their faith. Put this point in its context, we need to understand what the Babylonians were going to do to Jerusalem. So please turn with me to the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations quickly. The book of Lamentations was probably written by Jeremiah the prophet, who lived at the same time as um, Habakkuk did. And the book of Lamentations records the, the devastation that is inflicted by the, the Babylonians. So it's important for us to see this context and for us to understand this perplexity that Habakkuk had, okay? Lamenta Lamentations chapter 2. Look at verse 11 and verse 12. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. This is the lamentation of Jeremiah because of the destruction that has just happened to Jerusalem, okay? Look at verse 20 and verse 21. Look, O Lord, and see with whom have you dealt us. Should women eat the fruits of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priests and prophets be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young woman and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people, the Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. And this is ghastly, folks. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion. And this is what happened. And this is what Habakkuk knew was going to happen. This is what Habakkuk feared. The destruction of the Lord, the fear, the judgment of the Lord. The Lord said to Habakkuk, the righteous need to live by their faith. The righteous need to live by their faith. Not in what they see, but what they cannot see. Faith in the unseen God. The righteous trust God even when 
devastation, as horrific as the book of Lamentation describes, takes place. It is important to capture what God is saying. God is not telling Habakkuk that we are justified by faith. That's not what he's talking about here. God is telling Habakkuk that those who are justified live by faith. The statement to Habakkuk that the righteous live by faith is is quoted three times in the New Testament. And Paul quotes Habakkuk in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. And the writer of Hebrews quotes Habakkuk in Hebrews chapter 10. The writer of Hebrews uses Habakkuk to make the point they need to persevere through their suffering and continue to do the will of God because the righteous live by faith. The righteous trust in the promises of God and they remain faithful to the Lord through their suffering. And Paul uses a quotation in Galatians 3 to show that the righteous put their trust in God because no one is justified before God by the law, by their works. No one has been obedient to God's law, and we must therefore put our trust in Him to save us from the works of the law because we cannot save ourselves. And Paul uses the quotation in Romans chapter 1 to show that God has been faithful to keep His word, which is seen in His Son, Jesus Christ. God's righteousness has been revealed through Christ, who lived a perfect life so that He could die a perfect death. And the one who has right standing before God is the one who trusts in God's promises. God promised to send a Savior who would save us from our sins, and He did. But through all of this, Habakkuk needed to learn to wait, to trust the Lord, and to live by his faith. Not to put his eyes on the things of the world, not to look around at his circumstances, but to trust the Lord, to meditate on his glory, to meditate on the character of God, not to dwell in his bad situation. You know, waiting on God is hard. I'm not saying it's easy. But it is necessary if we are going to live by faith and grow in our Christian lives. And Habakkuk gives us a tremendous example of how to wait for God's answer to our problems. And I know that some of you today here are struggling, waiting for God's answer, waiting on the Lord. Maybe you're wondering about problems in your own life or problems in in your immediate family. But let me leave you with two lasting lessons that came to my mind from this text by way of application. First, know that things are not always as they seem. What may now seem to be totally absurd to you will one day make sense. The lesson of Habakkuk is that Sometimes you just won't be able to make sense of your circumstances, at least not right now. And until that day, you must learn what it means to trust in God and His promises that it all does really fit together in His time. And if God is waiting longer than you want, know that it is only for your good. And know that your time is in His hands. And he has promised never to delay his answer one moment too long. God answers in his perfect timing, not ours. Secondly, waiting for God's answer strengthens your patience and lengthens your perspective. And the short view of life is usually the false view. You know, first impressions are, are often wrong impressions. Initial impressions of God's working are, are usually incorrect ones. And that's why in waiting, you will have your patience strengthened. And you will have your perspective lengthened. Sweeping across Germany at the end of World War II, Allied forces searched farms and houses looking for snipers. And at one abandoned house amongst a heap of rubble, searchers with flashlights found their way to the basement. And there on the crumbling wall, a victim of the Holocaust had scratched a star of David. And beneath it, in rough lettering, they found the following message. I believe in the Son, 
even when it does not shine. I believe in love even when it is not shown. And I believe in God even when He does not speak. Happily and thankfully, God does speak, doesn't He, folks? But He does not always speak immediately. And sometimes He waits to answer our problems. And God wants you to wait on Him for His answers for a reason. He has a purpose for your waiting. And it is for your good. Learn to wait. Don't switch the, the channels. Learn the lessons Habakkuk learned while waiting for God's answer. Faith waits on the Lord. Faith hears the Lord. And faith obeys the Lord. And may God help each one of us learn these lessons as we live by faith. Father, we do thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for Habakkuk, who recorded this for us to learn from. We pray, Lord, that we would learn from his response. Lord, that we would learn to trust you, that we would learn to submit to your will rather than our will. And Lord, that we would learn that your character is perfect in every way. We are the ones who fall short. And may we confess that over and over again. Forgive us, Lord, for our unbelief. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to trust you more and to live by our faith in the one who sent his son to save us from our sins. May we live lives that reflect our faith. May we live lives, Lord, that will force other people to inquire about our faith. May we live lives, Lord, that reflect the God who is so perfect in every way that everyone would want to know about him. So, Lord Jesus, we ask, please continue to work in us and help us to live by faith. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 